Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Live for September 15, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. After a short hiatus, back with us is President of the Somerville City Council, Matt McLaughlin. Matt, you took a little bit of a break with colleagues. Are you rested? Are you ready to begin again? Yes, well, we took a break. Um, it was really kind of half a break because we had an emergency session. And then, of course, uh, the work never ends. We had community meetings uh, throughout the summer as well. Uh, but we took some time off and we just had our first council meeting last week. And, you know, we're back in back in the saddle, uh, back working for the city. It's all it's always a little bit of a it's a little double edged sword there. When you take a break, you think, you know, I really need it time to rest, time to recoup, time to relax. But then you come back to a thousand emails that need some more attention. So I, I know what you're going through, Matt. Let's, um, let's just pick it up with um, last time we saw each other was sometime in August. Um, our COVID rates in terms of infection, in terms of recovery, and in terms of actual fatalities from the virus are holding very, very steady. Um, is that your understanding in terms of the health and uh, health department updates and the health and human services folks? Yeah, you know, some of it continues to stabilize, uh, you know, a lot of the good work we put in, all the restrictions and uh, all the efforts we put into address COVID seem to be working very well. Uh, we're not resting on our laurels, though, because it could come back at any moment. Uh, but so far, you know, we, we've done very well comparative uh, to other cities or states. And we are still holding steady in terms of how the state rates us. We are still holding steady in that uh, orange range, yellow orange range. Yeah, we're still, uh, again, doing better than a lot of other cities of comparable size. Um, and yeah, we, we're, doing, we're doing all right, but not resting on our laurels, like I said. Good. So there are a couple of things that may affect that, Matt. And I know that uh, one of the things that surfaced, and, and I believe it caused the council and yourself as president to call for a special meeting, and that was the re-entry into our community of the Tufts University community. Do you want to chat a little bit about how that process went in terms of how Somerville and Medford were notified that the Somerville, uh, that the Mass, the Tufts University community was coming back for in-person learning. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so we had a meeting, not just for that, we had other issues that needed to be addressed that couldn't wait, but uh, the one that most people in the neighborhood care the most about is Tufts University, announced they were reopening and a lot of people had concerns about that. Uh, a lot of people were upset about the lack of communication about it, the fact that people in the neighborhood didn't feel notified. Um, and Tufts has had community meetings. They've attended several of our meetings to discuss this, uh, but the concern is still there. So we're trying to do what we can to impact it. Uh, the, no one came to the city of Somerville, uh, for, for, this, for the city council, I should say, for any real approval of anything outside of some lodging permits, which we're being told uh, we have to approve because every other city department already approved it. Uh, so that's a, uh, it's a point of frustration for the council because we're limited in our power and how to address this. Uh, but it is a concern and we're definitely uh, holding Tufts to task as much as possible to make sure that they're being responsible. So Matt, as I understood it following some of the news reports, there were two issues that were going on. One is the lack of communication um, that the council felt was coming from Tufts University about their in-person learning. The other issue was fear, or uh, maybe I'm using a wrong word here, concern by the Somerville community itself that a lot of the facilities that Tufts owns or their affiliates owns are actually in the city of Somerville, which may affect residents and businesses. So, uh, uh, you know, I did follow uh, one of the hearings that one of your subcommittees had and it was about the actual licenses of the boarding houses that Tufts University runs. How, how did we work that out in terms of Tufts monitoring those properties that they own? Yeah, so those permits are still in committee and that's another issue that we've had is that they actually applied for these permits in May and we didn't hear about the permits until late August. 
Um, so that was an issue that we had that like you're coming to us for approval and then you're telling us that every other city department signed off on this and if we don't approve it, then we could get sued by Tufts because all the other departments signed off on it. Uh, so that was a point of frustration. Uh, those items are still in committee and the city, is, the city council is working to try to find a mechanism for enforcement of Tufts own rules that if Tufts rules are violated, can we revoke these lodging licenses? Uh, so that's where it stands right now. We're gonna have another uh, license and permits committee meeting before the next city council meeting and we'll know then. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most people understand that, you know, it is the license holder that gets the punitive action for breaking of ordinances or violate, violations. So when I see, you know, news reports about, oh, Tufts University students are doing this and Tufts University students are doing this, I think the general public should be aware that, um, you know, there are certain things that the Tufts police can do. There are certain things that the Somerville Police Department can do, but there are things that the legislative body, meaning your council and the mayor on the administrative side, can do to enforce uh, safety protocols against Tufts University as the license holder. And I think that's really where it is now, you know? Yeah, I would say the mayor has a lot more power than the city council in this instance. Um, and although I, I, I do understand Tufts' desire to reopen, I think if any business or institution in the city had the ability to reopen, they would. Uh, but we put restrictions on a lot of other businesses, a lot of other institutions of comparable size uh, with the same issues. And we, those people are on hold and Tufts is moving forward. Uh, so I think that's kind of the frustration people have is the inconsistency with the policy and the sudden feeling that, oh, somehow we can't do anything about Tufts, but we can do something about Legoland, we can do something about yoga studios, we can do something about biotech companies, uh, everyone except Tufts, it seems. And that's, what, that's the point of frustration. And again, I do understand their desire to open um, but the idea, I had conversations with people in the neighborhood. I gave them very frank assessment that, you know, we're talking about enforcement now, but you can't control, we can't control the 80,000 people in Somerville. So how is Tufts going to control the few thousand students they have? A fish is going to swim. People are going to do their thing. Some people aren't going to respect the rules. Some people are going to decide to party. Um, and you can enforce the rules to the best of your ability, but we're only limited in so many resources. So we're, we really just got to hope that Tufts in the city is taking this very seriously, uh, enforcing their own rules so that the city isn't uh, dealt with the burden of having to enforce the rules for them. Well, let's look at it this way, Matt. There are plenty of examples out there where a university or a college or a larger institution um, promised that they had all their protocols in place. They tried to do their best with enforcement but then a COVID cluster appeared in their midst and they were forced to shut down again. We've seen that in the news across the country and here in Massachusetts, where, yeah, you do your best to try to control the behavior of whether it's in a restaurant, your patrons or a college student at your university. But if something happens, you're gonna be right back to square one if that virus takes off within your community. Yeah, and that, that is my fear is that Tufts will end up having to close eventually anyways um, after everything we've gone through. And now the city has set back a few steps in our fight against COVID, which we've done really well on. And there is just, there comes a limit to what you can do to control other people's actions. And we can only go so far before that, that control becomes oppressive and people have an issue with that as well. Um, so I think the best policy would have been to just not open at all. Uh, the same policy our some of the schools are doing where everyone's operating remotely um, makes sense to me, but that's not the situation we're in. So we're trying to deal with it the best we can. Great segue, President McLaughlin. Somerville school systems are slated to open uh, on the 18th, which is this coming Friday, and then go into full swing, so to speak, uh, on the following Monday. Um, you are a member of the Somerville School Committee because of your position as president of the council. You wanna kind of give an update as to uh, what the school committee and the SPS system are looking forward to for the fall. Yeah, so the plan right now is to open all remote. Uh, so students will still have to uh, 
work from home, uh, which is unfortunate, but it is kind of what has to be done right now uh, because of everything I just explained is, you know, you can't control only to the best of your ability, a classroom of a few dozen students, a school of a few hundred students, uh, you can't control everyone's actions. So the best option right now, unfortunately, is to operate remotely. And we're hoping that, you know, as hopefully a vaccine is created or as we move into a different phase of COVID, that we can reopen, that's still an option. Uh, but currently the plan is all remote um, and the, uh, the uh, school committee is working with the teachers union on their plan for how to teach students. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. It's basically all remote until we get through this crisis, which still exists. People don't seem to, some people have forgotten that we're still in a crisis. So it, it really, I mean, I don't say this in a flip way, but it gives all new meaning to the word homeschooling. Uh, for the fall system for Somerville. My understanding, we had um, Ilana Krepchen, who is the school committee person from Ward 2. She was on the show last week. And my understanding is that there will be constant assessment taking place as to how well the virtual learning is going. And the school system, the school committee and the city administration will be taking a look at in around the Thanksgiving time as to what the plan may be for uh, December, January. Is that, do I have that right? That we'll be constantly yeah, that, that, yeah, we're gonna be constantly assessing. And, you know, again, uh, something that I have been candid with people about, I spoke to a group of uh, some of those students um, who asked, you know, how, if we can make sure something like this never happens again. And I told them very frankly that we can't guarantee that. And one of the things I, I repeated to them is like, this is not a perfect situation. This is not the situation we wanna be in um, because I don't care how hard the teachers work and how hard the students pay attention. It is not gonna be the same quality of education that they would get if it was in person. And that's unfortunate because we're doing this for people's health. Uh, so their health is coming before their education. And I encourage any students, if you're watching or any, uh, anyone in general, uh, to really take this opportunity to educate yourself. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, we, we have information at our fingertips because of the internet. And you can get in any piece of information in the world in seconds. And sometimes people neglect that. And I, I personally have done a lot of reading, a lot of studying during this crisis just to you know, keep my mind active. So I would encourage people to do that. Take, a, take it upon yourself to educate yourself. And then when we get through this crisis, uh, we can get back to normal and get back to regular education. But, you know, they're not gonna be able to provide the same level of education. I think it's important to be honest about that. And hopefully we get the students back in school as soon as possible. So two things on that, I think you know, or you may or may not know by now that um, we are, um, we are in touch with the Somerville Public School System, mainly for after school programs. And the Somerville Media Center will be participating with them to try to fill the gaps, you know, because parents are going back to work. It is school time, September through June is school time. Um, so we are trying to work out our programs and I think they're pretty much in place uh, with the Somerville Public School Systems. But the other thing I wanted to mention about kids in their virtual learning world is that we've heard a lot from politicians these days about kids going back to school, whether in person or in a virtual or a hybrid. We've heard a lot from the teachers, including their unions. We've heard a lot from the administration about what's right, what's wrong. We've heard a lot from talking heads like me about what's right, what's wrong. The Media Center is gonna work with the school system and we plan on producing a program and hearing from the students, hearing from the kids of this city. Going back to school virtual, going back to school in person, um, what do they say? Have you got a sense, you, you mentioned that you had spoken to a group of students, have you got a sense of, is there an overwhelming desire to go back to in-person learning or are some of them hesitant because of the virus? I would say it's mixed, uh, just like the population in general. Like we had a public hearing uh, where a lot of parents and teachers got up uh, speaking uh, and they had mixed opinions as well. 
uh, the teachers were pretty much adamant about not going, not returning to in-class uh, teaching. And the parents, mostly the people who attended wanted to, uh, wanted to send their students back to school. And when I've talked to students, it seems very mixed. It's like there's people who are afraid to go back to school. And then there are people who are just very frustrated with having to work from home. And I understand that because, you know, their parents have to go, some of their parents might not be able to work remotely. Um, others are working remotely right next to their kids. And that can be very frustrating. And I definitely understand people's frustration on that. I understand the students' desire to socialize with each other and to play sports and to go to class and uh, be in the cafeteria together. Uh, so I would say it's very mixed, but I, I, I'm for th things like this, are not decisions we should make based on opinion. Uh, it should be made based on the science, based on the level of risk. And I feel like that's the path we're taking right now. I, I don't think there's anybody, students, teachers, or parents who really want to continue uh, with all remote. It's just something we have to do right now. Yeah. It's not like the old days, Matt, when you and I were in school, when they called a snow day and we were out of school for three days, we would be overjoyed with that. Um, I, well, I, I think if I was a student, I'd probably still be okay with it, but that was just me. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people, yeah, they're ready to go back to school and be with their friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go right into a business update. Uh, many of our restaurants and our businesses are back open in a very limited capacity. Um, there are still some businesses that are not open. Um, and they will not be open until what the governor says and the mayor says is like phase four. But do you want to make a comment about our business environment in this latest phase of reopening? Yeah, I can tell you just from an East Somerville perspective. So I represent Ward 1 and working with a lot of businesses here. A lot of the businesses are open. Um, they're enforcing social distancing mechanisms. A lot of the restaurants have been doing delivery and takeout during this entire crisis and have uh, weathered the storm pretty well. Uh, then there's other businesses that are just stuck in this phase where they're not reopened either because of the state guidelines or because the city has determined it. I'm thinking of things like Legoland and the AMC Theater, um, places that are all indoors and generally have a lot of people from around the region come there. Uh, so they haven't been open yet. And, but a lot of the restaurants have, um, you know, we haven't seen, you know, unfortunately we have lost a few businesses. Slumbrew uh, is going out of business as a result of this. And a few other businesses are definitely suffering um, that, you know, all the grants and loans that we've provided just aren't enough to get them through this. Uh, so that said, you know, I see Casey's is open. That was kind of my uh, canary in the coal mine there. If, if Casey's is open, it looks like we're moving along. Uh, Mount Vernon restaurant has really nice outdoor seating that I know I uh, walked around with you uh, to examine. And a lot of the restaurants on Broadway seem to be doing all right. Uh, some of them not so much. And then I think it really just comes down to the next phase is these places that naturally gather large groups of people indoors and what we want to do with that. So we haven't made any decisions on that yet. Matt, it's going to say a lot about my um, spiritual life, but I, I think I may have missed it. Are churches now open at limited capacity, or are they still closed? I believe they are still open. I, I don't know myself either. I guess that says something about me. Well, now, both, now the world knows I that believe they're open with a limited capacity. <laughs> the world now knows that we are both non-practicing in whatever faiths we have. So. I guess so. I, I, we do it remotely. I watch it on TV. How's that? Yeah, exactly. My grandmother there, does that. There you go. So let's, um, yeah, I, I don't want to make any, any kind of pronouncements outside of my role as um, licensing commissioner, but um, the governor did make an announcement uh, last Thursday that he is going to be very willing to extend as long as the local uh, uh, authorities say it's fine. He is very willing to extend beyond November 1st outdoor seating for all the restaurants. So I think that's welcome news for some who will be able to manage and get through that. Others may not think it's worth it to stay outside during the colder months because they won't be able to provide you know, any kind of comfortable setting for their, their patrons. But others may come up with, it surprised me, Matt, in the business world, the, the inventiveness 
and the uh, creativity of some of these restaurants in how they're going to look at the winter months and try to keep people out there. Um, keep them coming back to their to their establishments. So we'll have more to announce on that on the 21st of September um, when the licensing commission meets. Um, so hopefully we will be able to announce uh, the extension of dates, what we're going to do about winter to try to provide them with all the tools they need to stay open. Um, let's go into the regular business world. There are some things that you wanted to talk about um, and, and I Ah, one of the things in the regular order of business is the ordinances that are on the books. And uh, most recent, you were talking about the anti-gang ordinance. You want to make some comments about that? Yeah, so uh, this was an order um, that I submitted a few before the recess, and we quickly dealt with it at our last meeting. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of uh, issues, you know, the repercussions of the death of George Floyd and police brutality across the country. And I feel like a lot of elected officials are trying to find ways to contribute and to address this problem. And, you know, I look at things uh, from a city councilor perspective is, you know, what are our laws on the books? What laws can we change? Uh, what are our policies that we can change? Things of substance uh, as opposed to symbolism uh, that I try to focus on. And something that's been on the books for over a decade is this thing called the anti-gang ordinance which came into existence in 2004. Uh, you've been around Joe, so I'm sure you remember. A lot of issues we had with the MS-13 gang uh, during this time, and there was a reaction from the public and from the city council to do something about this. It was a legitimate problem. Uh, it, was, it was a real gang with real issues um, that were affecting the community, but they came up with this anti-gang ordinance, which uh, just never sat well with me. It was basically, you know, allowing the police certain liberties when dealing with crowds of people. Um, and it, it came from a, a uh, Chicago ordinance that was deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. And the city of Somerville decided to take it up despite this. And they watered it down enough to get rid of the constitutional aspects, but maybe it was also completely useless at the same time. So I but, felt at the time, Matt, I think what, what the council was looking at is the intent of that ordinance yeah. was to control the situation at the time. However, it was dangerously close to being unconstitutional. Yeah, it was either unconstitutional or completely useless. Either way, I felt like it should go. Uh, Denise Provo, who's our state rep, uh, who's leaving now, and she was on the city council then, said that it was a political hoax with no real teeth to it. And my colleague, Councilor Anita Gang from Ward 5, appropriately said at the last meeting that was an anti-Latino ordinance and a dark stain on our reputation. And the reason I brought this up, um, it, it's never been used by the police in any official capacity. So there is a degree of symbolism to it about removing something that hasn't really been used. But I really felt like it was time to get rid of it. I've always wanted to get rid of it. And the only reason I didn't was because it's never been used. And I feel like I wanted to bring it up to highlight to people that, you know, 2004 was not that long ago. And the city of Somerville could still be considered a progressive city at that point. Uh, but 10 out of 11 councilors and the state legislature approved this. It was a home rule petition that it was approved by the state legislature, something we can't get them to do for really basic things. And they passed this anti-gang ordinance. You know, I'm, I'm glad, Matt, that you said that, the 10 out of 11, because it's always been in the back of my mind that when um, current state rep Provo was on the board of aldermen, she was the dissenting voice. She yeah. voted against that ordinance. Yeah, and the state legislature approved it. So that means the whole state agreed on this. Um, and it just, I, it just was something that I wanted to show people that, no matter how progressive you think your city is, when people are afraid, uh, when people demand action, lots of times even progressive people will allow other people's civil liberties to be violated. And this is to me, an uh, example of what's happening nationwide uh, in much greater issues such as the war on drugs or the war on, uh, the war on crime or the war, the war on terrorism, things like this, um, that people are willingly sacrificing their liberties or the liberties of others for the appearance of safety, and that's all it is, is an appearance. Uh, there, no one was made any safer by this ordinance. 
So I felt it was time to get rid of it and we approved it. It was unanimously um, repealed at our last meeting. You know, there are some, Matt, that would argue that because of the ordinance, it had a, an effect on the MS-13 gang in East Somerville. Do you, do you subscribe to that, that the ordinance itself caused them to move? No, that's a lot of garbage. Uh, they were all, the main MS-13 members were arrested and deported by, I, uh, by um, INS at that point. No, that was ICE. Uh, that ICE came in and deported a lot of people, and that's why MS-13 disappeared. It had nothing to do with this ordinance um, or anything like that. So that's, that's a lot of garbage. <laughs> Well, I do think in addition to you having satisfaction on that and the other counselors currently on the council, I think you've made uh, State Rep Denise very, Provo very happy with eliminating that ordinance. Yeah, I talked to her. I consulted with her before I did this and she was very supportive of it and uh, gave me a lot of good advice and backdrop as to why this was approved. And she told me uh, that, you know, a fellow counselor told her at that point that it was political suicide for her to vote against this. So it just shows again that like the public wanted this. This was, this isn't just to berate former counselors for their decisions. It's to talk about the fact that the public wanted this. And we have to remember this the next time something like that happens to stay vigilant and remember that, you know, all of that Black Lives Matter and that this is how issues like this come up. Well, it wasn't so much political suicide for uh, Representative Provo because she went on to become state rep. Exactly. So, you got to hold to your principles sometimes. How, how's that for the irony of the whole thing? Well, now, I, I think it just stands for the fact that she stood up for what she believed in and others caved to pressure. And that's sure what did. happens. She sure did. Matt, I want to thank you once again. You are the, the soldier standing strong, leading the council. Um, let me know next week if you have somebody else that you want to come in. But until then, please stay safe, stay informed and we'll see you next time. All right, thanks, Joe. Thank you, Matt.